So good afternoon. Welcome, everyone, to our work of literary merit with Dr. Kim Hester Williams today. She's from the English department at Sonoma State University. We're so happy to have her here. I'm Abby Bogomoli from the SRJC English department. And I hope you will join us another time in April 10th, at April 10th at noon, for our next WOM event titled Kindred and American Allegory with Matt Murray, my colleague, and myself. Today's event runs until 1 o'clock, and it's being recorded, hence the sound effects. So if you have to leave before 1 o'clock, please do your best to avoid walking in front of the camera here on the right. Dr. Kim Hester Williams' talk today is titled Better Days and Gamma People, Afro-Eco Poetics, New World Making, and Womanist Speech Sounds in Octavia Butler's Post-Apocalyptic Imagination. Dr. Hester Williams teaches 19th century American literature, African American literature and culture, and ethnic literature in the United States and California. She is an affiliate faculty in the American Multicultural Studies Department, as well as Film Studies and Women and Gender Studies. Her scholarly research concerns racial representation in 19th century literature and contemporary popular culture, and visual representations of race in film and new media. Dr. Hester Williams is co-editor of a collection of interdisciplinary essays on race and environment, Racial Ecologies, published last year. This book collection includes a chapter she authored titled Earth Seeds of Change, Post-Apocalyptic Myth-Making, Race and Ecology in the Book of Eli and Octavia Butler's Womanist Parables. She has also published essays on the representation of race, gender, and economy in new media, popular culture, and film. Her current scholarship considers race ecology and Afro-eco poetics with particular attention to the work of science fiction writer Octavia Butler. Additionally, Dr. Hester Williams serves as a consultant for Legacy, a journal of American women writers. Her analysis on media, gender, and race has been cited in numerous essays and on blogs, websites, and referenced in books including Mixed Race Hollywood, the films of Stephen King, Horror Noir, Blacks in American Horror Films from the 1890s to Present, and Black Men Worshipping, Intersecting Anxieties of Race, Gender, and Christian Embodiment. Her essays have been taught in courses at the University of Washington, the University of California at San Diego, and University of Wisconsin at Madison Cal Poly in a media studies graduate course and included in a course entitled Postcolonial Perspectives on Audiovisual Media at Stockholm University Department of Cinema Studies. Her current book monograph, Minstrel Acts, Black Pain and White Redemption in the American Imagination, examines the historical trajectory of the magical Negro, figured from Harriet Beecher Stowe's best-selling 19th century novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, to contemporary 20th and 21st century popular representations of the magic Negro, most notably in the novels of Stephen King, Joyce Carol Oates, Jonathan Lethem, as well as in films featuring Denzel Washington, Will Smith, and Black Panther, and sports figure Serena Williams. Throughout the book, she explores the dialectical relationship between the commodification and the consumption of blackness and the ongoing persistence of the ideology of white supremacy. In addition to her scholarly work, she writes poetry, which is feminist-centered and grounded in the long tradition of African-American womanist po poetics. We're very happy to have her here, so please help me in welcoming Dr. Kim. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor B, for that very generous um, introduction that I was asked. Um, I, I wanted to say a little bit more about what I do um, so that you all would understand my perspective, the perspective that I'm going to um, offer 
to you today. So um, I'm going to try to stay on script because I'm really bad at that. And then I go over time. And so I'm going to try to be really good about that today. Um, so let me just say good morning. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation and opportunity to come speak with you today, especially in honor and yes, celebration of Women's History Month. Yay! <laughs> Need to hear a hand clap. Need to hear a hand clap. I am, even, every month is really Women's History Month, but anyway, that's an aside. Um, I'm delighted to be here with you at this esteemed institution and famed college where many of my former students and friends um, teach as instructors, um, brilliantly, I might add. And so it just really thrills me to be here. Um, and I, I will say that I was, uh, Angie said, well, you know, would you mind coming to speak? Um, having the lecture be during March, during Women's History Month. And she doesn't know this, but it, secretly I was like, oh my God, yes, yes, it's my lucky day. I actually get to speak during Women's History Month. And of course, I, I, I didn't, I wanted to dress professionally, but I struggled not to wear my Captain Marvel shirt that I got yesterday. Yes, as my, 22-year-old and 13-year-old would say, yes, yeah. Saw that yesterday in a packed theater in Vallejo. It was awesome. It was quite awesome. So I'm really pumped. I'm, I hope I can contain myself, actually, because I do tend to get carried away, as some of you who know me know uh, that, that I do. So I'll, I'll, I'll try to control myself. I'm going to do my best to stay on track, as I said, to keep to the script and to leave time for questions and or comments. Um, I'm very anxious to hear from you um, and to hear your responses to my thoughts. And I might add especially that today I'm on sabbatical this semester and I'm supposed to be writing a book, a book that I've been actually working on for 21 years, no lie. Um, literally, I've been working on for 21 years on and off. And I'm pretty glad that I didn't write it and publish it when I, University of Minnesota had done a reader's report, a review of the proposal and was very excited about the book, but wanted me to do a lot of things, changes and, and, and things, um, a lot of revision. And I sort of just was busy with teaching and my family and things and I, I just set it to the side. I never really returned to it. And then, oh my. 2016 happened, something happened in 2016. I'm not quite sure what it was, but I think it was pretty big. And, um, it, it, and even before 2016, things have just been leading up to the moment uh, for me uh, that this book is not only the, the reader back then 20 years ago said, this is an important book, but you need to do X, Y, and Z. And now I really feel, I feel like this is an important book. So today is a day where I'm kind of working out the ideas of my book and doing some finishing touches on, because I journal all the time about the book and, and my scholarship um, and just life. But um, this morning when I was preparing, put, putting the finishing touches on this talk, I thought, wow, this is the first day actually that I feel like I'm working on the book, doing what I got the sabbatical to do. Uh, so I'm really, again, I, I can't thank you all enough. John, I don't know if John's in the audience, John, Keach Lowe and, um, and definitely Angie Evans and, and Professor B. Thank you so much for inviting me here um, today um, to continue to work through these ideas and talk about someone and something that I love very much, fandom all the way, Octavia Butler, and of course, Kindred, which I teach all the time. So um, I'm gonna take a little bit, um, what, I, I'm gonna refrain from any spoiler alerts because I understand that some of you are still reading the novel Kindred, some have read it, and some here may not have read at all, haven't even opened the book on this wonderful, um, climactic, page-turner, surprise ending, if you haven't read it, right, um, story. Um, or maybe you haven't read any Octavia Butler at all. Um, if the latter is indeed the case, I recommend you rectify this right away. Um, Octavia Butler, I have never had a student in my over 20 years teaching at the university level, at the college level, I have never had a student complain about reading any Octavia Butler story or novel or anything. So if you haven't read it, you're missing out 
I guarantee you. If Google does a, on her birthday, if Google is, is celebrating Octavia Butler, then I think you realize something, something is uh, there. There's a there there. So um, I, um, I want to say, and excuse me for saying I'm um, all the time, but I, part of it is just me trying to keep on track. Um, I do plan today on doing something I have never done before. I've sort of hinted at it, I've sort of dabbled in it, but I've never done it full on, as they say. And today, I'm gonna take the opportunity in this beautiful auditorium to do it full on. And that is, I want to take you on a journey. I want you to travel with me today, as we do in science fiction. That's what we do, that's how we do it. If you saw Captain Marvel, that's how you do. You, you journey, you travel. So I wanna ask you to do that today with me. Um, I would say, as the Staple Singers famously crooned, let me take you there. You see, I know a place, a place I believe you may want to go. I certainly, myself, want to go there. Let me, for this hour, take you to a place that I don't think you've ever been before. Let us, you and I, hashtag T.S. Eliot, go there. Let us, you and I, go. We shall begin with a poem and then a song, as I always do in my classes. So you might be wondering about the title, um, and I keep, you know, um, I'll, as I always do, keep reworking the title. Um, over and over. Nikki Finney said, I never, poems never finish. You just keep re rewriting it even when it's published. So I've been working on this title a lot, but I do want to try to give you a hint, you know, some context for where the title comes from. All right. This poem is titled Affirmation. I believe in living. I believe in the spectrum of beta days and gamma people. I believe in sunshine, in windfields, I'm sorry, in windmills and waterfalls, tricycles and rocking chairs. And I believe that seeds grow into sprouts, and sprouts grow into trees. I believe in the magic of the hands and in the wisdom of the eyes. I believe in rain and tears and in the blood of infinity. I believe in life. And I have seen the death parade march through the torso of the earth, sculpting mud bodies in its path. I have seen the destruction of daylight and seen bloodthirsty maggots prayed to and saluted. I have seen the kind become the blind and the blind become the bind in one easy lesson. I have walked on cut glass. I have eaten crow and blunder bread and breathes the stench of indifference. I have been locked by the lawless, handcuffed by the haters gagged by the greedy, and if I know anything at all, it's that a wall is just a wall and nothing more at all. It can be broken down. I believe in living. I believe in birth. I believe in the sweat of love and in the fire of truth. 
And I believe that a lost ship, steered by tired, seasick sailors, can still be guided home to port. That is a poem by none other than former, maybe you say current, Black Panther, Asada Shakur, written in 1968. Very prophetic, I think you might agree, as is the work of Octavia Butler, whose students always ask me, how did she know? The parable of the sower, how did she know about the floods and the fires and the famine and the political corruption and the debt slavery and the sex slavery and the everything that's in that novel, how did she know? Because we know, because we've been living it 400 years. We've been living it, we know. So I want to, a little bit of a disclaimer, if you will, or full disclosure, if we prefer that term. I am very much, I'm not going to try to make it any kind of secret because it isn't. To add to my bio, I'm definitely a Marxist feminist, unabashedly so. Right. Very proudly. In other words, capitalism is a no for me. It can be a yes for you. Now, I'm not here to convert you. No siree, no ma'am. But it's a no for me. Hashtag middle passage is all I have to say. So I am also, however, a hippie. No, no, I'm a black hippie. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I was born in 1965. I love to tell this story. My sister's gonna crack up. I love to tell the story. You know, my husband was born in 1964. There's a significance. He and I are very different people. He is a lovely person, and he is, his principles are crazy. He's a crazy principled person. But he is a baby boomer. Did you know that the cutoff for baby boomers, 1964? And he was born 70 years old, in my opinion. He came out the womb 70, and he's been 70 ever since. I was born after that, the year after the cutoff, in 1965. And I swear to God, I haven't taken a shower in two days. I'm not lying to you. I hope that it's not offensive to you. I don't think, I think it's fine. But, um, I, and I don't have a problem with that, right? I don't. I have, I embrace it. I embrace all of my peace, love, happiness, hippie. I can give you a whole PowerPoint on it. That's not the PowerPoint for today, but just so you know, right? Um, and, and so, and I'm also, a feminist, as I said, a womanist, hashtag Alice Walker. I am definitely an African-Americanist uh, in, in, by trade, from what I was trained to, to do and study, to teach and still study. Um, Afrocentric, if you will, um, very steeped in the black vernacular tradition. Grew up that, have to code switch all the time. I certainly can speak the King's English. Absolutely the favorite, loved it. You should see it if you haven't. That's, I, I'm conversant in all of that. Um, but I have to code switch. One, I curse a lot. And I said to myself this morning, you don't you go in there with those F-bombs. You don't do that. You respect this institution. So I won't be cursing like I always do. <laughs> Even my 13-year-old curses because she says, you curse? I'm like, no, but you're 13. <laughs> so anyway, so we have these debates about curse. So I won't do that. But I, 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 what I can't resist doing is speaking to you in black vernacular. So you will hear me fall in and out of it, black vernacular. Also, the worse things get, or maybe I should say the more things stay the same, I find myself speaking in song lyrics and in movie lines. You know, like that one, Francis McDermott in Fargo. My favorite movie line of all time is, all this for money? Yeah, when she comes across the dude, 
putting the dude in there? Wood chipper. Yeah. Because this elaborate scheme to get money. Here's this man who is, um, you know, is being controlled by this other dude for the most part. And he's putting this other dude in the freaking, I can't help it, see, wood chipper. And she says, the cop, pregnant. I love it. Pregnant. About to have the baby any minute. Cop. And she sees this man putting in a wood chipper. She's like, all this? For money? Right? So forgive me if I do that. Make references to literature, film, music, whatever that you don't know. What are you going to do? Your students. That's actually a real question. That's a for real question. What are you going to do? Yeah, well, I don't have time. I want you to take time for what I'm doing. That's a good answer, though. And I, I will. You can raise your hand after I finish talking. Uh, write, it down. write it down and? Exactly. That's it. Fist bump. Excellent. Fist bump to you, too, because you definitely should raise your hand. Right? So you're going to look it up or ask your instructor. They'll tell you. You'll, you'll figure it out. I don't have time to, you know, decode is what I'm saying. So um, let me cut to the chase um, and, uh, and uh, get, get, to the, get to the thing now that I've given you all my disclaimers. Um, all right. So uh, I think that that actually, no, I'll save that for later. Um, so now that you have a little bit more context and insight into the title of my lecture, which is a little bit different um, than um, Professor B wrote um, that she read, but a little bit, not that, that much different. There are a couple words that are different that I changed. Um, and this is also from a cut and paste from a previ previous lecture on this, because I, I do lecture on this all the time. Um, but now that you have a little bit more context, I want to share a personal anecdote uh, about something that recently happened to me in Roner Park. I was stopped by the Roner Park police. You know where I'm going with this. Um, and our 13-year-old daughter, who I just told you about with the cursing, debates about uh, cursing, swearing, she was in the car with me. And uh, ironically, we were on our way to her favorite restaurant here in this whole Sonoma County, and that's Amy's drive through because my 13-year-old doesn't eat any meat, fish, any kind of living animal whatsoever. And she rails against people who do, including myself and her dad. So anyway, we were on our way to Amy's, and she was very excited about that. Um, I, we were just coming from Sonoma State, and uh, I, I basically, this to me was my own close, uh, up close and personal face-to-face -face confrontation with Black Lives Matter, or as Mac Michael Eric Dyson puts it in his beautiful yet wrenching book, Tears We Cannot Stop, a sermon to white America. I recommend that book highly. So trigger warning, when I've read this before, I put it in an email and then it was popular and so I just shared it with other people and I, black, the Africana Studies lecture, I, I read it and people were very emotional. So I decided, oh, okay, I probably should give a trigger warning for this, right? Just so you know, if you're sensitive to this, as you should be actually. Um, all right, so, um, and this, I assure you, is part of the journey. We're gonna get to her. We're moving in a straight direction, a straight line. So, um, Here's, here it is, and I want you to go with me. Let me take you there. What do you think it would be like? Hmm. I wonder if in the future we manage to solve the race problem. Like, what if we were in some kind of futuristic world? I'm getting to the smart Marona Park Police in a, in a minute. But I'm just wondering, I just want you to think, like, like Butler, like what if you could imagine the future? And we were of a different species and evolved, very evolved humans. Some likes this, let's put it, seems like it's taking so long for things to change. Let's put it in 4000 BC. <laughs> and so what if we were there? And you know, there was no race, gen, none of that. None of that existed. I'm not the first person to do that. Samuel Delaney, Ursula Le Guin, other science fiction writers have done that. So please don't accredit that to me. But we're just pretending now. Um, and what if those beings, those advanced beings, would say, look back on us? And they'd be like, what? Because that, like, race is not, not even scientific. 
as my anthropologist colleagues will tell you in a minute. That's the first thing they teach anthropology students, by the way. The very first thing they teach anthropology students is that race is a fiction. It's not biological and it's not scientific. Why is that? Any science majors in the house? That is excellent. That and 99.9% shared DNA. 99.9% shared DNA. All of you and me. So it's not whiteness. It's actually not a scientific thing. It's a thing. It's real, but it's not biological, right? So what if they look back and said, wow, that was dumb? What the heck? What were they doing? I don't understand. Loving versus loving. What the heck? You couldn't marry somebody who was from your own DNA? <laughs> they might look at it that way. Who knows? But alas, we do not live in such a world. As Octavia Butler's work beautifully and painfully instructs us. Um, and I'm sorry to keep using the word painful, trauma. I don't know how else to talk about race. We do, however, live in a world where I was pulled over by a white motorcycle policeman in Roner Park. He was male. And I had to immediately tell my 13-year-old brown girl daughter to, as soon as I saw the sirens, and the, the sirens were for me, I immediately turned to her. And she was obviously to my right. And I said, calm down. I said, remain calm. And remember what we saw in the film, The Hate You Give. I said to her, as he was walking over on her side, passenger side, quote, put away your phone and just look ahead and remain calm. It's going to be okay. That was exactly what I said to her. The officer was actually kind. And that's not surprising, I will say. He was kind. And after checking my license and registration, he said for me to do him a favor. Apparently, according to him, SSU faculty are caught speeding often. And I was the second faculty member he had stopped within the span of 10 minutes. Shame on us. Um, so he asked me to do him a favor. He said to tell my SSU colleagues to slow down. He proceeded to say that I had, quote unquote, precious cargo, looking directly at our brown girl daughter, Alana, while he said it. And he said that, continuing, quote unquote, I should be more careful. I agreed. I do have precious cargo. I apologized and said, yes, I will slow down and spread the word to other SSU faculty. I actually said, was it, was it a student or a faculty? Was it a student that you, look at me, was it a student that you stopped? And he said, no, it was a faculty member. So I'm proud that I'm spreading the word, although probably maybe the faculty here doesn't need that message, but there it is. But then something extraordinary happened when he walked away, got on his motorcycle, drove away. This was quite unexpected. After he pulled off, Alana and I laughed, you know, that nervous laughter. And I said, quote, phew, that was close. Glad I didn't get a ticket, because I already have points, actually, full disclosure. And that it didn't turn into a hate you give scenario, I said. To which our little precious brown girl daughter laughed and replied, quote, I know. I was ready, mom, and then proceeded to throw both her hands on the dash, assuming the position, if you will, of the instructions given to the father in the film, The Hate You Give. These instructions, um, these are the instructions, excuse me, black parents routinely give to their children to keep them alive. Yes, she threw her hands, both hands on the dashboard, and leaned over in the classic, now classic, don't shoot gesture. I was shocked, or as my children might say, shook, <laughs> to say the least, when she did this. And I responded immediately, what are you doing? Because we were laughing, but the laughter ended for me there. 
I said, what are you doing? But I was also very sad. Although I wanted to laugh along with her, I was crying inside. When I told my husband Henry the next morning what had occurred, he did not laugh. He said she was quite the comedian and sort of smirked and then quickly said, how sad. Indeed. So I just want to say, as I go on to talk about Octavia Butler and I, Angie, somebody, the timing has to happen. You realize that. I can't do it myself. I'm just not capable. OK, OK, I'm not capable of it. <laughs> so anyway, um, I've just seen some things in the, in the last 10 years, all my life, but I really, in the last 10 years, in really in the last two years, things that I've never seen before. The people that were in that Captain Marvel, I mean, packed. Black Panther packed. Uh, the conversations that people are having. You know, let me give you a little hint. Let me give you a little tip. You know, I don't know you all very well, but let me give you some advice. If you want to do white supremacy or patriarchy, oppress women, you know, I, I think you might want to try a different approach because it seems like the approach of repression and saying you can't do it, like I'm going to use the metaphor from the novel, Kindred. Like if you cut off my arm, I'm going to find a way. That's not going to stop me. You know, Kuta Kente and Roots, you cut off the leg, he's still running. He's still running away. They had to cut off both the legs. Had, you know what I'm saying? I, don't, I think you need to try a different approach because white supremacy and, and patriarchy and misogyny, these things seem to fuel. They don't seem to stop what you're trying to stop. They seem to be like, it's like fertilizer. I'm just saying, that's some advice because that's not going to get it, right? Freedom always finds a way. It always does. And it always will. Because to go to science fiction, Asimov writes in iRobot, if you read, and if you don't read the novels, Will Smith famously was in the adaptation of iRobot. This line is not in the film, but this line is from the novel. It's like any organism, anything, resist domination. And that novel is crazy. The film doesn't even, the film is scratching the surface. If you read Asimov's novel, those robots are off the freaking hook. Talk about sentient. They're cra it's crazy. The novel is crazy, the things that those robots are doing. And they're doing it because the humans continue to try to oppress them and enslave them. And they're but, oh, hell, but no. I, at one point, it's so hilarious. In the middle of the novel, I was like, I'm smarter than you. What? You think you're going to oppress me? I'm a robot. I'm artificial intelligence. I'm like 50 times smarter than you are. What? No. And in the novel, it's hilarious because the robots are resisting and revolting that entire freaking novel. Right? So I, I don't know, just a thought. Different approach. Or maybe none at all. Um, OK. That leads me in a direct line to the PowerPoint, finally, which I do have time to do. And by the way, uh, as far as our journey is concerned, I do want to point out that I have been to the Octavia, um, the OEB archives, Octavia Estelle um, Butler ar archives, down in Southern California, down there in Pasadena. Um, and uh, they, she was, like me, a hoarder, apparently. <laughs> she, she kept everything. She kept every single scrap of paper. I'm talking shopping list, grocery list. Uh, she was famous in uh, the affirmations, which is why I read that um, poem by Asada Shakur. She always, I'm going to be a famous, literally, she wrote, I'm going to be a famous writer one day. I'm going to make a living being a writer. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. So here you see from her journal, this is excerpted from her journal. It's one of the famous ones that people like to quote all the time where um, she says, so be it, see to it. See, she says, reach the top, meaning her books, bestseller. You see it underlined. Bestseller, reach the top, stay on top for months, at least two, which is funny. Um, you know, all this stuff. And then she says, I will find the way to do this. So be it, see to it. And I want that to be our mantra for today. 
I want, I want us to think about that on our journey, that whole idea of willing something into being. What if we willed racism out of being? What if we willed whiteness? And I specifically am doing, I, I, am, I am being very provocative. That's what my book is about, by the way. My book is about whiteness. I'm zeroed in on it. Because as Michael Eric Dyson writes, in Tears We Cannot Stop, Robin D'Angelo, who is white, writes in white fragility, it's a disease. I'm sorry, you can walk out if you want to, but I have to keep it real. What has kept us from being free? From being together, connected as one. Just think about it for a minute. Um, so, um, I, I, I do want to will something into being here. Something that we might not have even considered before. And, I, I, and this, uh, let me say this, if we decided that whiteness wasn't a thing, and believe me, I come to you as a professor, over 20 years I've been teaching at Sonoma State, and whenever I talk about this, whenever I say something like whiteness is a fiction, the white students in my class, particularly the white women, but all the white students are like, they're shaking their head now, because if they weren't, then I might th rethink what I'm saying. But the reason I'm so committed to this is because I see them shaking their heads when I say that. Yep, that's right. Don't want to check the box anymore. Don't want to be beholden to this anymore. And if I leave you with nothing else today, when you read Kindred, think about Rufus. People don't want to think about Rufus. My students, we debate almost verbal fisticuffs last semester over Rufus. Ah, Rufus is a slaveholder. Ah, Rufus is a rapist. Ah, Rufus, 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 Rufus. I don't want to talk about Rufus. I hate Rufus. But you think about why Octavia Butler writes a novel in which we cannot set aside Rufus. We are not allowed to do that. Because if we do, if Dana does, she actually won't exist. Hashtag kindred. Look the word up. Kindred. We are connected. We are tied. We are interwoven. We are interconnected. If the ship goes down, by the way, my favorite, as soon as I leave here today, I got to catch up on American Gods. I love that show. I love that show. It, it's lit. It's lit. I have never seen anything like that in my life. And I don't get to watch a lot of television. Students are always like, watch this, watch that, watch this. And I watched that on my own. Nobody recommended it. I was like, what? American Gods? What's that about? Oh my God. Don't, if you don't want to sit there for hours like I did, it's glued, don't turn it on. Don't turn it on. But, but so it's this idea that we're, we're, we're longing. We are jacked up. The there's an there's a overnight suicide walk in the city, in San Francisco, in June, yes. The depression, the opioid. I'm writing about all this in my book. It's off the hook, what? What is it? Why? Why aren't people happy? I just want you to think about it. Why is a certain person who will remain unnamed today so freaking unhappy? I want you to think about Rufus a little bit differently than you might have thought about Rufus before. Then you might think, be instinctually moved to, to reject him, to not have sympathy for him, not have empathy for him. I want you to just stop for a minute and think about why she centers that novel. Oh, I'm going totally off script now. <laughs> but it's in, the, it's in the notes, but it's far down. Why? why? And he's a, we know if you study literature, the device of using a child. It's not like we come across Rufus and he's a mature slave holding, you know, son of a bee like in 12 years a slave. It's not that. Or, or um, Leonardo DiCaprio who brilliantly played Master Candy in Django. Oh my God, I hope he won an Academy. I don't know, I wasn't keeping up that year. But he sure deserved one. Because that, you, what I call that eugenic scene, where he puts that skull on the table, and this is the slave, my daddy's, my granddaddy's slave, 
and you all are inferior to us, and let me explain, let me give you a lecture on racial difference, which is straight up from the book of eugenics from the 19th century. If you don't know what eugenics is, you need to look it up. You need to research it, right? So this is the thing. She, what she does, she doesn't present us with that kind of Rufus. We're introduced to Rufus, not only is he a boy, not only is he a child, but what's happening? When Dana's thrust back there to save her ancestor, what, why, what's he doing? Exactly right, my friend, exactly right. Now, in literature, in literary studies, we don't look at things literally. What is the metaphor there? This white boy is drowning, but I submit to you, and I'm totally off script, but I, I don't care. This white boy is not drowning because the water is there. The water is a metaphor for whiteness. That's what's killing Rufus. That's what's preventing Rufus from being with Alice. Now, we argue fist to cuff. The students and I are going at it, because I asked them, do you think, just innocently, I, do you think that Rufus, and I know I'm going, what I'm going to get, do you think that Rufus loved Alice? Oh, they lose them. Oh, my God. Why are we even talking about Rufus? We're supposed to be talking about Dana. And then they go off on this whole long, elaborate thing about Dana because they, they know Dana backwards and forwards, like the back of their hand. But I'm like, but, but wait a minute. I just want to know. Do you think maybe, possibly, that he loved Alice? Because, you know, they grew up together. I'm not at the beginning of the novel now, so I'm not spoiler alert. But maybe they, what, what about a world where they could have loved? Because, it would be one thing if she wrote a novel where Alice was like, get out of here, I don't like you. I don't want to be with you. That is not what happens in that novel. That feeling is mutual. Until slavery comes, I would submit to you, whiteness comes and breaks it up. And Alice says, I'm black. I know what the deal is. But guess who doesn't? Can you guess? Thank you. He never figures it out because he doesn't want to figure it out because he's in crisis. It's called racial trauma, people. Black people aren't the only people. Latinx, API aren't the only people who suffer from racial trauma. So do white people. That's why it's so freaking bad and that's why it has to go. Because it, it affects everybody. The 19th century writers, Melville, Harriet Beecher Stowe, with all their flaws, Henry David Thoreau, these white abolitionists, these rabbit, Angelina Grimke, these people were writing about what the heck? We're going down. The ship's going down. We got to save ourselves. It wasn't, it was altruistic to a degree, but it was like, we got to save ourselves. We're going down. We can't be killing people just because we want to kill people and separating families and selling people on the block. Oh my God. <laughs> right? Think about it. I just want you to think about it. So in my five minutes that I probably have left, uh, we did that already. Uh, I just want to tell you what the other world looks like the black vernacular world that Octavia Butler wants us to imagine and embrace. Self-awareness. Think about Dana this way. And think about what Rufus could be. Endurance against racism and other forms of oppression and discrimination. Teaching as it delights, because Kindred is, is absolutely del delightful. Resistance a refusal to submit to a dominant ethos. A refusal, because what about Rufus? Rufus could, could have been a different story. Rufus could have been like, Dad, you know what? No, no. Angelina Grimke, famous 19th century abolitionist, grew up in a wealthy, wealthy Southern family. She had everything, everything she could ever have wanted materialistically. Your slave passed the salt pepper to your Relatives, slave, you didn't even touch the salt pepper. Hashtag the favorite, I keep bringing that up, right? No, privilege up the you know what. 
But she said, but you know what? My brother just beat this man, beat the slave. And I don't, are we supposed to be Christians? Mm. Okay, 13 year old. Mm. Are we supposed to be Christians? And it, it, it messed with her mind. She said, no. And she left and went to the north. She left the wealth and the privilege and all that she had because she could not reconcile that in her mind. Resistance and being innovative, being creative, and preserving community. So um, I think I'm going to just skip and say the black vernacular's main function, right, is to triumph over this chaos. And again, I will reiterate myself. The chaos that we have been experiencing is called whiteness. And this is the answer. Love, unity, and community. So I'm going to skip on, because I was going to hold the whole thing on feminism. Once again, once again, I have gone out of time. But um, I also want to point out, this is hyper empathy. If you read Parable of the Sower, there's a character who has a quote unquote disease, a condition called hyper empathy. Think about that for a minute. Hyper empathy. Not no empathy, but hyper empathy. Um, I want you to just imagine. Um, this is another story, by the way, published earlier, um, near of kin. You see how kinship is so important. But here, I want you to think about, it's actually published right around the same time. Close your eyes. I'm going to leave this. I'm going to leave you with this. I want to leave you with this, because I know I'm out of time. Close your eyes. For real. I'm actually, that's not. For real. I for real want you to do it. Close your eyes. I want everybody to close their eyes right now. Just take a meditative moment and imagine it. Imagine it. First of all, imagine you are Dana. You're thrust back in the past and there's this white boy and he's drowning and he's flailing in the water and you're like, what do I do? Wait a minute. I'm sorry. Let's do a different one. You're Rufus. You're flailing in the water. You're trying to save you. What, what? And a black woman comes and saves you. She, she gets you out that water. She, she takes you, embraces you. You're saved. You're, you're OK. You're not going to die. What do you do? And then just imagine this. Like, you are here, but there is no color associated with you. There's no box to check. There's no kind of supremacy or subjugation or marginalization or power struggle. You just, you just exist. You just exist. I told you I'm a hippie. I, I just want you to think about the peace, love, the happiness, the tranquility. You save from the waters of whiteness. And it, it's just no more. It's just no more. So final slide, because I always like to do this at the end of my slide. And I'm going to play a song as you're walking out. Uh, I am going to play a song. But you know what? Because I can't leave without bringing in Queen Bee. Because I just, that's how it is. Yeah. When you wake up, wake up like this. Thank you. So. Um, that's my not spoiler alert, kindred lecture, kind of the nuts and bolts of it. But I will stick around for questions. And as, as I'm sticking around for questions, I just want to say my daughter introduced me to this group. Raise your hand if you know Hiatus Coyote. Love, love, love them. So I have a lot of songs I wanted to play, but I ran out of time because I got carried away, which I'm not, I'm not mad at myself. But I am going to play this song. There's a staple singer, so let me take you there. And there's Lauryn Hill, Black Rage. But I, I, I'm a hippie. I want to get it. I want to get it to be positive. I got to end on a positive note. So we shall. We shall. I don't know why it's called that because I call it. Yeah, I don't know why it's called Nakamara because there's probably a reason I should research it myself. I'm a hypocrite, right? I should research that. But this is about love. Hana, my darling, I will follow you. I love white soul people. Sun. White people singing soul is like the greatest thing ever.
Oh, you know, it's just, um, you know, it's just, um, so, I'm just going to play it in the background because, you know, it's going to, it's going to do that. But, um, while it's doing that, I want to see. Yeah, it won't do that. I'm going to let it play. It's just a three minute song. So if you want to hear it, you can hang out if you, if you want to, if we're allowed to do that, um, you can hang out. If not, then, um, I will answer questions. I will stand right here and answer any questions that you have. I'll just put it low. And I actually need to put the captions on. Let me see. Why? And I actually need them, because I don't know what the heck she's saying, other than love. So please, um, please feel free. Thank you all so much. Come up. I'll answer any questions you have.